The catch, it all began with a disagreement over supper. In terms of my interpersonal relationships, I'm special, but the spouse does have some pals. She also enjoys having people over for dinner and quiet discussion once in a while. I'd rather take a waterboarding. However, if I appear overly indifferent during one of Kari's social evenings, she becomes even more distant when it comes time for bed. That's why I was acting appropriately around her spouse and her college roommate. Her best friend used to be her roommate. They had been together since their first semester in the residence hall. I'd always thought Isabel had a poker up her butt from birth. Perhaps that was because she was as patronizing toward me as she was toward her kids. Kari told me she had a great time in college. Since I didn't meet any of them until five years later, I was unable to confirm that. It was obviously not something I wanted to meddle with, though, because she had changed from being fun to the woman I met at age 27 who carried a razor. Isabel was such a man-hater that I couldn't help but wonder how she managed to have two children, unless she used a turkey bastard, that is. Isabel's spouse was a tall, slender man with great looks. He belonged to the horde of cunning foreign service types that swarm Foggy Bottom. Without a doubt, he was just a 13. However, he had taken on an air of fake seriousness only somewhat less pretentious than that of a Russian Grand Duke because he was at stake and the same scorching mound of condemnation. I was always curious as to how a player like Scott had come to be involved with such a stiff woman as Isabel. Given that they both attended Mass somewhat more regularly than the Pope, I believe there might have been some Catholic guilt involved. I'm very sure Scott didn't think highly of me. That made sense because, well, I don't actually have a job. Alternatively, to put it more precisely, I sell items to the highest bidder rather than having a career. I won't go into detail about how I came to work as a reverse engineer in code. But believe me, honesty or kindness had nothing to do with it. When I reached puberty, I discovered that most of school was dull. Furthermore, I was cunning enough to avoid having to complete my schoolwork. I therefore had a lot of free time when I was 13. I used that time to study everything I could about the subjects I was interested in. I started my eternal descent into hell by breaking down and deconstructing popular gaming programs in an attempt to find every secret key concealed in the binary. My gamer pals thought highly of me as a result of that. However, by the time I was in high school, keying was not at all difficult. I then set out to find other intriguing options. And in the hexadecimal of commercial code, I discovered them. If you find a zero-day vulnerability in one of the big tech corporations' products, you have no idea how much money they will pay. This is particularly valid if they believe you would divulge that information to the Washington Post. Blackmail and ransom are such derogatory phrases. I'd prefer to think of myself as Robin Hood, holding the big tech companies accountable. Either way, by the time I turned 21, I was comfortably earning six figures, and there was no end in sight to the gravy train, because the software industry does not become better with age, unlike excellent wine. At the time, my parents were my hosts, so my social scene basically consisted their basement. There are always willing parties to trade Call of Duty keys for gamer girls, mainly goth girls with the obligatory tattoos and piercings. Most evenings, I would party in my back cave with them and my friends. We abstained from alcohol. We were therefore never that loud. However, I was eventually ejected from the adult living quarters due to the lingering smells of cannabis sativa. That brought me to a Manassas condo. The price was around $200. I had never paid rent on my previous hideout. I therefore had that much money in my checking account. The diverse decor was to put it mildly. To me, fashion is nothing. Really, I had lived in a cellar in Centerville for the majority of my life. I used items I discovered by the side of the road and furniture from the Salvation Army to furnish my home. There were a lot of futons and beanbag seats in the living area. I enjoyed the atmosphere even if the dining room table had a gunshot hole in it. Overall, it was a perfect life. Still, as I grew older, I started to get that aging sensation. It was the ancient desire to find a person I could love and who would love me back without conditions. I naturally acquired a dog. Buster was a giant, muscular, odorous, brown dog that was very dedicated. His former owners abandoned him in Anacostia and tethered him to a cinder block. I saved him from the Washington Pound. He has a demon hound's appearance. Additionally, his hide is covered in scars. I believe his original breeding was for fighting, but he just wouldn't fight since he is so kind and polite. It was difficult to identify the exact type of mongrel he was because he possessed so many traits from the large breeds. All I knew for sure was that his mother must have had a very busy night. Whoever the real father was, that much was certain. However, no one could ask for a greater buddy or travel partner. We converse frequently. He has the exact same voice as the large black man from the Green Mile. It would take a dog lover to comprehend how that could be. However, you understand what I mean if you own a dog. I had a lovely nerd life with Buster, up until Eve showed up in the garden one lovely day. While I was waiting for Buster at the dog park in Costello, I noticed a woman walking a rat on a leash. I examined her as Buster examined the bushes. She had dark brown hair and a clean preppy bob cut, and she was small, maybe 5'2". Her petite form was adorable. She weighed around 110 pounds, wasn't particularly plump, but rather somewhat slender and well-groomed. 
I was drawn to her legs, though. Dressed in a short dress and high heels, she seemed as though she had run home from work to walk her dog. I was experiencing the Marilyn Monroe impression because of the wind. Additionally, it flaunted a ton of gorgeous, well-muscled leg and round buns. I even had a glimpse of what was at the apex of those long, lovely limbs when the wind gusted. It was a flawless lower body gem. I was intrigued by that as I'm a leg and butt guy. She was moving in my direction. She was aware that I was observing her. I gave her a smile. She let out a growl at Buster. I've never understood Chihuahuas. With his long, dripping fangs and thick, armored fur, Buster weighed around 140 pounds. And she weighed maybe 5 pounds, a dog with delusions. However, Buster retreated a step. One of his most charming traits is his absolute refusal to engage in conflict. She won't hurt him, the woman assured me with a smile. Adorable. I could tell it was a female because of her pink collar studded with rhinestones, and I remarked, well, your princess is certainly full of herself. Then Kari stopped and told me precisely how conceited Chiquita was. Coffee followed by a date and eventually marriage resulted from it. I should definitely clarify it. However, I am unable to. I had the impression that I was on one of those moving sidewalks at Dulles from the moment I met Kari, where holy matrimony was the inevitable end point. Maybe this was the right moment. Perhaps she really was that gorgeous, and maybe I was at a loss on what to do. Kari is, to put it mildly, tenacious and willful. And in that regard, our pets and I are alike. All I know is that we clicked right away when we first met. I'd never been in a relationship. I'd had my fair share of women, sometimes for few days, sometimes for a week, and once for the whole summer. However, there had never been any stability to the agreement. Simply said, I'm not that into people. Kari was not like the others. Despite the fact that I am not emotionally sensitive, I felt at ease and had a connection with her. When we were together, I felt much happier and more secure. She had the ability to make me imagine happy thoughts instead of my typical nerd world weariness. However, it's possible that the attraction sprang from her status as the sexiest woman in the world. However, she has stunning, strongly muscular hips and legs. Kari is your woman if you enjoy gorgeous, long, full legs. Did I also mention that small round butt? She told me it was genetics when I asked whether she was a dancer. Whatever it was, it was extremely rare. The somewhat boring-sounding position of missionary was especially appealing to her. But what really set our fights apart from each other was the way she used her legs during those sessions. She would always try to control me. Additionally, Kari was noisy during our joint sleep. Kari is an extremely intelligent lady. I adore intelligent women. She worked for a K Street firm as a large girl, and she was generally a pleasure to be married to. She would occasionally get upset with me, but I put that down to her Mediterranean ancestry. Her ethnicity is Italian and Greek, which is a terrible mix if you're looking for a woman with a steady temperament. She appeared to be riding a wave of emotion all the time. The ones that were joyful and ecstatic were my favorites. I rarely felt angry, and I wasn't a huge admirer of it. Our physical lives were quite active, but things slowed down during our emotional outbursts. Her episodes of rage were largely focused on how little social interaction we had. 100% of that was my fault. My mind is where I dwell. I am aware that can occasionally be annoying. Together, the two of us had an intriguing and satisfying life overall. Together, we would read, chat, walk the dogs, and overall have a relaxed lifestyle. However, Kari would occasionally experience feelings of missing out on things. And even though I detest entertaining, I understood that in order to keep Kari in check, I needed to be a little more amiable with other people. That was the reason I was sitting there with her trash of a husband and her garbage pal on that specific evening. Isabel is the beautiful one, in case I forgot to say that. Perhaps it was the reason Kari looked up to her. Isabel stood three inches higher than me. However, she was the one with the large frame, tiny waist, wide hips, and hourglass form. Her face was also far prettier, nearly like that of a classic glamour model. If she had been half as erratic as Kari was, she would have been a movie star. However, Isabel makes me think of the word drippy. Either she was brooding over something, or she was terribly depressed. She appeared very irritated by me. But most people are affected that way by me. I believe it is as a result of my lack of concern. After we had dinner, the real celebrations began. A coffee table sat in the center, and we sat on opposite couches, facing one other. The fireplace was at a straight angle off to the side. It was an appalling depiction of yuppie coziness. After our marriage, Kari hired a decorator. I had to pay an extra $100,000 for it. However, I can afford it. Finding vulnerabilities in the software industry is similar to selecting low-hanging fruit, as I have stated. Our condo was now furnished like something out of House Beautiful. Buster's head was resting against my leg as he slept in front of the large gas fire. Like she normally does, Chiquita was sprawled out on top of his wide back. Their sleeping arrangement is a heartwarming illustration of canine affection until Buster turns over while he's sleeping. When it happens, he gets an ear clipping. Cointro snifters were being held by Kari and our guests. I was sipping Miller Lite straight from the bottle. Kari was seated behind me, her arm lying along the back of the couch with her amazing legs tucked under her. 
With their feet flat on the ground, Isabel and her spouse were seated straight at opposing ends of their couch. It resembled something from a novel by Jane Austen. Since we reside close to Washington, D.C., talking politics is only natural. Politics doesn't interest me because I'm a nerd. However, Kari is employed by a lobbying business, and it goes without saying that her pals are a little more liberal than Karl Marx. They disagreed on how to put an end to the government's unjustified meddling in people's lives. Her spouse, like many of the foggy bottom types, was a bleeding heart. Also, Isabel held stronger libertarian views than Thoreau, with a dash of Woodrow Wilson's misguided political idealism. This was particularly valid in regards to the idea of individual privacy. She was furious at the sheer notion that the government was tracking private persons' cell phone usage. I did not tell her about the NSAS massive data repository and its storage capacity of zettabytes, because I thought that would actually make her actually have a stroke. Had I been wise, I would have just stopped talking. However, the entire conversation felt like they were talking about string theory with third graders. Oh my god, they knew nothing about it. After a while, I became a little irritated and remarked, you don't have any personal privacy. Forget the government. Anybody with the slightest bit of technical proficiency can invade every aspect of your private life if they want to. With the same pouty expression they would give someone who had just farted aloud in church, they all gazed at me. The cheerfully contemptuous husband of Isabel, Scott, remarked, Now really Tommy, how could you say something like that? I understand that you don't work but that is just plain naive. I find his attitude of superiority irritating. I'm not a complete wimp. With a hint of bitterness in my voice, I responded, Really? Idiotic. Please give me a moment. I then reached over and grabbed my smartphone that was positioned on the coffee table in front of me. But like most guys buy golf accessories, I buy harmful malware. For someone like myself, the stuff I obtain from black hat websites are recreational items. Except for the dark web, none of the websites I visit are accessible because they are all on the Onion router. And I use bitcoins to make purchases. In situations like that, no one in their right mind would use a credit card. If you want to completely delve into someone else's life or perform magic tricks at a dull party, my small creatures can be rather useful. Naturally, none of the three individuals seated there was familiar with Bluetooth security. In under 15 seconds, I was able to drop everything I needed on their phones. As a matter of fact, it took me less time to fully possess them than it did for Kari to get out another bowl of dip. Casting a quick glance at Kari, I added, call Scott. She called him, looking perplexed. My phone lit up and his phone rang. Hello Kari, he said, picking it up. Adding, and hello to both of you. They both appeared awestruck. Though not what I had anticipated, it was nonetheless satisfying. I said, that is a man in the middle app. I just dropped it on your phone. All I needed was to be within 30 feet of you in order to do that. Now I can listen in any time you call each other. Both of them were astonished and little anxious. Isabel burst into tears. But but but, that's so criminal. Where did you get something like that? I replied, I got mine off of the crack you website for 19 bucks worth of bitcoins. But you can buy less powerful phone cloning tools off the regular internet. Harry and Scott looked at each other intently. It seems as though they had not anticipated my level of weirdness. Subsequently, Kari gave me a scowl as though I had given her a diamondback rattlesnake. Take that thing off my phone, she exclaimed, clearly agitated. I made an unduly dramatic point of wiping the thing and added, your wish is my command, O oh, most loving of wives. I think Kari took too much from my comment. It was evident on her face. It escaped my understanding. She is affectionate. I then theatrically gestured and stated, for my next trick I want Scott and Kari to go out onto the deck and just talk for a minute. Close the door after you go so you are sure I can't hear you. They appeared perplexed. Humor me, I exclaimed. With much hesitation, they both stepped out onto the deck. I only dropped the other thing on Kari's phone, so I turned it on. Spying is not good. However, she was my spouse. Naturally, it didn't really matter who I spied on because I would never be caught by the authorities. I had sound and picture on my phone right away. She had her phone in her hand and was staring at it as if it were about to bite her. Her expression was one of worry. Immediately behind her, peering over her shoulder, was Scott. Do you think he knows? Kari asked, her voice rather agitated. According to Scott, I certainly hope not. I had no idea he would do something like that. It's downright evil. His expression was filled with nervousness. You can come in now, I said, cracking open the patio door in my most upbeat tone. They both entered with an air of discomfort. Isabel had listened to all of it. She was perplexed and possibly even a touch irate. That was nothing new, of course. Her default facial expression is pissed off. I raised my phone and listened to their whole talk, video included. Scott's and Kari's faces grew pale. I got it. He felt ashamed about being discovered making fun of me. It's also likely that Kari felt bad about letting him do it. I said, there is no need to get upset. I am just trying to show you what your world is really like. Consider it part of the evening's entertainment. That was said in an attempt to make amends. Since it was evident that I had let a bit of a skunk loose in the bridge club for ladies, Isabel had the appearance of a dog that had just seen a bird while hunting. And she was very, very angry with Scott. 
Hari and Scott, meantime, were arguing frantically in low voices outside the patio door. Nor was Isabel missing that. I attempted a shaky laugh. I was completely confused. I did not want to be a bother. I was merely bringing up the subject of individual privacy. So no harm, no foul, right? I asked with a pathetic smile. It didn't appear to be helpful. Isabel struck her spouse. She really did have a thing for him. Without saying anything more, she walked out the front door, stomping. I heard the tires squeal as the automobile started. How could you do something like that? I know you're insensitive, but that was a horrible thing to do, Kari scowled at me. I gently said, I'm really sorry but I don't understand the problem. All I did was use your phones to make a point about security in the information age. Here, let me take the bugs off of them. I also made a great deal out of cleaning both gadgets. You are an adolescent fool. I can't believe that a wonderful woman like Kari could live with an idiot like you, let alone marry you, Scott stated with a tone full of disgust. Before I had a chance to respond, he marched out. Kari, I need a ride home. Can you take me? I told Kari that I'll come too. I really am sorry if I caused any problem. I just want to apologize. You've caused enough trouble. You just stay here, she added, giving me the look that suggested I was a complete screw-up. She quickly put on a coat and hurried out the door, leaving Scott behind. Her car backing out was audible to me as the garage door opened. Along with the other party supplies, I cleared the dishes. She was still absent, though. I then ascended to our bedroom and dozed off. The following morning, Kari seemed somewhat reclusive. She spoke in monosyllables in response to whatever I said. I could sense she was upset with me, but I honestly didn't know why. The previous evening, I'd made her butters appear a little foolish. However, it didn't seem like a reason to punish me in the morning. Kari appeared troubled as well. Her appearance, usually tidy and well-groomed, was unkempt. She appeared to have been up all night. Just striking up a conversation, I asked, what time did you get in last night? I would have waited up but I got too sleepy. She gave me a cross-examination style stare. She said, I was gone a couple of hours. Why do you care? Are you stalking me now? Naturally not, I replied. It merely takes 20 minutes to get to their place. I was aware that Scott was looking after you. However, I thought you would return in an hour, so when you didn't, I became worried. She became quite pale and slumped into a chair. The dogs interrupted me to inform me they needed their morning constitutional right away, so I got up and took Buster's leash just as I was going to ask her what that was all about. Pant pant slobber slobber, he came dashing up in his slightly uncomfortable swaying manner, saying, are we going for our walk now, boss? I asked Kari, are you going to walk Chiquita or do you want me to take her too? You take her, she said, giving me a suspicious look as if I was trying to con her into doing something. I must clean myself up and take a shower. That sentence held significance, but I couldn't understand what she was saying. It seemed like she was anticipating a confrontation. Chiquita was dancing at my feet and I grabbed her leash as well, saying, hurry center, I have to go so bad. With my two dogs hitched, I strolled down to the dog park. When Buster is headed to the dog park, he can be a little pig-headed, but otherwise, he is the most cooperative dog ever. I have a big choke chain around his thick neck. It's not a macho thing, I have to use it when he has an idea in his head and wants to just go. His windpipe was blocked by the chain, which is why he was gasping as we were walking. He is a lovely dog, devoted and caring, but he is not too smart. Of course, that didn't stop him from pulling with even more fervor, and I reasoned that after he passed out, I could undo the choke chain. Chiquita was tripping alongside him in the interim, her small legs moving like a blur, trying to look like the dominant dog. After we completed our business, I was surprised to see that Kari had disappeared. She was not picking up her phone when I tried to reach her. I had removed all the offensive content from her phone, but even with that, I could tell she still didn't trust me. I felt like she was avoiding me on purpose. Her location was at Tyson's Corner when I texted her. Shortly after that, I was in the middle of decompiling a new edition of a well-known tax preparation tool, and I had a feeling there would be a good deal of stolen property in that mess. The doorbell rang. Chiquita went crazy, as she usually does, and Buster had to rush over to add his two cents. Buster never used to bark, but since he met Chiquita, he has picked up a lot of bad habits. His bark is so deep that it rattles the windows. I answered the door, kicking both of them out of the way, so I didn't see who was waiting for me on the other side right once. When I finally did, I almost shut it again. Isabel herself was standing there, all condescending magnificence. I think I would have enjoyed a visit from a Jehovah's Witness more. I unlocked the door to let her in, but since she is my wife's friend and there was that misunderstanding last night, I figured she was coming to clear things up. Is this a good time? She asked. I'd like to come in and discuss. I moved aside and spoke the perplexed words, Kari's not here. The bee responded, I know that, and gave me a look that wasn't quite contemptuous. That's why I arrived right away. Are you drinking any coffee? And then, without so much as a farewell, she strolled past me toward our kitchen. We have an open floor plan downstairs, and Isabel was wearing FMPS, a skin-tight pair of jeans that must have cost $300 and a loose peasant-style top with a scooped neck that flaunted an absurd amount of cleavage. The walk back to the kitchen is about 30 feet straight ahead. 
The sight of those large round buttocks twitching their way toward the back of the condo was making something in my pants go, even if it hadn't been my wife's rubbish companion. Isabel was a she-devil, yes, but she also had a figure to die for and a cloud of musky aroma that hinted at feral mating habits in the jungle. While I was popping a pot into our coffee machine, she settled onto one of the kitchen chairs. I offered her the dark aromatic product, figuring that a woman like Isabel would drink it black, despite the fact that it was roughly the same color and consistency as diesel oil. With her eyes full of gratitude, she cupped the mug in both hands and took her first sip. She took her time, so I watched her. She was obviously made up to kill, since I had never seen her not made up like that. I sat down across from her with a curious expression on my face. Her features are very stunning. I focused on her face because I would have fallen into the deep valley she was displaying to me if I had glanced a little bit further south. She knew that if I had stared at those two magnificent peaks, I would have been tempted to bury my face between them and make motorboat noises. I know a trap when I see one. I attempted the cliched conversational opening line, so what brings you here on a Sunday at noon? The way she leaned back in her chair to present those massive objects gave me the impression that she was aiming them directly at me. It reminded me of the scene when a battleship raises its main guns in preparation for firing. I wanted to talk to you about last night, she stated. I was curious as to what action you would take. I was shocked, I hadn't even touched her phone, and now she was expecting me to atone for something. I answered, I don't know, with a tone full of fury. How do you want me to do it? I intended to return the initiative to her. She appeared to be nodding in agreement, as though my irate reply had improved her perception of me. Well, you have Scott, that's for sure, she remarked. Not that it's not worth it. How else are you going to handle him? I can't believe you are asking me that, I exclaimed. I'm furious with Scott since, after all, he had branded me a foolish teenager. However, I have no further plans to harm him. Don't you think he has already learned a difficult lesson? He was aware that I had grown out of my hopeless weenie status. She gave me a respectful look and added, he sure did. He's afraid. I believe him when he swears that nothing of the sort actually happened. However, I still haven't made up my mind on what to do. That struck me as a somewhat odd remark. What knowledge of Bluetooth security does she have? I really want to know what you are going to do about Kari, she remarked. You know that she's afraid too. An hour ago, she called me in complete distress. Is my Kari afraid of what? Could it be the reason behind her unusual behavior this morning? Even though I truly had no idea what Isabel was talking about, I forced myself to act sensible because I didn't want it to appear as like I knew nothing at all about whatever my wife was afraid about. With a perceptive glance in my direction, Isabel appraisingly added, she'll do anything to make it up to you. She can't bear the idea that she may have lost you permanently. She loves you unconditionally, despite her extreme naivety and stupidity. I have known her for 13 years and I can reassure you as a woman and her best friend that you will never have any reason to doubt her. The conversation was getting odd. I never doubted Kari about anything. Her friend sounded incredibly arrogant to go there. On an issue as significant as trust, I felt compelled to be clear that I was not going to allow anyone to speak for my wife. I therefore said, perhaps a little too harshly, I know Kari, and I have no doubt that she will repay my faith. That's because I'll take steps to ensure it. I make it my goal to communicate with you on a regular basis. You have an amazingly tough and practical mind, Isabel observed, glancing at me with a mix of respect and something more. Still, wouldn't you like a little payback? For what? I exclaimed. Now that it's over, I can say with total certainty that it won't occur again. No matter how serious the provocation, I for one was done with technological tricks, and to be honest, the more I thought about Scott and his insults, the longer it would be until I saw him. With a dejected expression, Isabel responded, Well, make sure to call me if you ever do, with much meaning. I'll ensure that it's worth your time. Well, that was intriguing. I had no clue what she was getting at. She had treated me like a four-year-old for six and a half years, and now it felt like she was offering me something to make up for it, but I had no idea what it was. However, I realized it would be rude to simply decline her offer, so I said, You will be the first one I'll call if I ever do, with a confident tone. With a promise in her eyes, she gave me a quick glance before dropping her coffee cup, getting up from the table, and sauntering back toward the door. I got up to go with her. Remember what I told you, she murmured at the door, turning to face me with a tone full of serious emphasis. Kari is aware of her error and vows to never make it again. You are able to rely on it. I was still going to monitor Kari, even though I knew she would be far more astute about her online persona in the future. I'm going to make sure of that, I answered, grinning back at Isabel. You're familiar with the Reagan maxim, trust but verify. My shoes almost melted as she gave me a sultry glance, and I realized that Isabel was definitely something very unique, just like Kari had said. Then, without turning around, she opened the door and twitched back out to her Mercedes. Soon afterward, Kari came home, carrying a six-pack for me and a pizza, as if her arrival had been timed to correspond with Isabel's departure. Where have you been all afternoon? I asked. I was beginning to worry. She gave me a snide glance and added, I went shopping at Tyson's. What place do you suppose I went? 
Don Nada, it was just that you didn't pick up the phone, I said. I thus sent you a message. Before I could say anything, Kari gave me a very angry look and said, I'm getting tired of this cat and mouse game you are playing with me. I was going to tell her about Isabel's visit. I felt like I needed to reassure her in some way, and I suppose it showed on my face since I was genuinely perplexed. I firmly declared, I'm not playing any games at all, in my voice. Permit me to reassure you that in the event of an issue, I will promptly, assertively, and firmly address it. And when I do, I swear that I won't hold back. She looked horrified, clapped her hands over her mouth, and hurried upstairs to the master bedroom, slamming the door behind her. Now, I was really worried. I felt as though my little antics in the parlor had strained our relationship, so I tiptoed over to apologize via the bedroom door. I heard Kari chatting agitatedly to someone as soon as I opened it. All she was saying was, last night, I told you. It's over, completely over. She raised her head to see me standing there, dumbfounded. Her expression defies description, it is one of shock and wonder. I smiled quizzically and asked, what's over? To whom were you speaking? Was that related to last night's events? Does Scott still have anger issues? You can tell him to shut up for me if he is. In my perspective, he is history. She was like a bird and I like a king cobra as she just sat there on the bed and stared at me. I smiled and replied, I just wanted to make a point. I don't think I have to demonstrate it once more. There was no need to talk about the electronic jungle anymore because I knew that they all realized how terrible it was right now. However, I truly don't want to see either of them for a long, I stated. Furthermore, I'm still attempting to decide how to handle Scott. She pale and gasped. Her reaction was so severe that I decided I would try to distress a little bit, even though he had not shown me any respect. In the most modest way possible, I said, forget him. All I want is for us to move on from this now. Her eyes widened in surprise as she gazed at me. With a voice full with bewildering optimism, she responded, you do. Are you prepared to let go and move on? That was a lot to expect, given how rude and offensive Scott had been the previous evening. After giving it some thought, I exclaimed, what the hell? In any case, all of the water was over the dam. I love you Kari, no matter how badly I may have been treated in the past, I will not let that stop me from being with you in the future, I stated. I simply want it never to occur again. Thank God, she said as she gave me a sincere and excited glance. Tommy, I adore you. I pledge that it won't take place once more, but I will never understand women. That apology sounded overly dramatic for what was essentially just a small quarrel. She was crying now, and she got out of bed and pushed herself at me, wrapping her arms around my neck. I was perplexed, but I'm a male too, and nothing like makeup bonding after the fight. That's what ultimately brought me to my knees, seeing her fall into a trembling heap. We lay there on our backs, panting, till I managed to haul myself up on one elbow. She looked at me, scared and unsure, as if she wanted confirmation. I chose to give her some appreciation, saying, that was amazing. What caused it to occur? That didn't seem to be the approval she was seeking, because she started crying uncontrollably. She was blubbering at me in every conceivable way, saying things that made no sense since it sounded like an apology from someone who had just slept with me. I gave her a kiss on each eye to wipe away her tears and told her, Kari, I love you. Isn't that sufficient? I tried to lighten the atmosphere by saying, hey, there is a piazza and beer waiting for us downstairs, but that threw her into yet another round of sobbing. She held herself to me like she was not going to let me go. She kept clinging to me and pleading with me not to go. Don't leave me, please. The whole thing was starting to get awkward, so I kissed her forehead and said, the only reason I am leaving you is because we need to eat. She was still lying where we had ended, her dress pulled up, her legs spread wide, fluids running out of her, sobbing, when I sat up and got my pants back. I got back on the bed and embraced her once more since she seemed so sweet and fragile. Perhaps you didn't understand my world yesterday, I responded in the most direct voice I could summon. However, I know that you now get it. Furthermore, you will always know that, when it comes to me, the best course of action is honesty. She resumed her horrified expression. Oh, how I wish I was more socially adept. It had been an unusually heated session, but she stayed upstairs for a long time, feeling as though there were other things going on in addition to the bonding. She appeared to have had a come-to-Jesus moment and wanted to reflect on it for a time. Her actions since yesterday night's dinner have been utterly perplexing. When she did come downstairs, it was in a short white linen dress that flaunted those amazing legs, it was so girlish and innocent that it gave the impression that she was going to her first communion. She had such a sweet appearance that I concluded it was best to forget about it and that whatever had been going on between us was, in the words of the great American philosopher Frank Sinatra, just one of those things. Together, the dogs and I savored our pizza. She wanted to talk about babies while we were eating, something we had been putting off until she got her career in order. The little creatures didn't really intrigue me, but Kari, who was approaching her early thirty seconds, felt that she should give them a shot. I posed the obvious query to her, why now? She added that she wished to strengthen our ties as a family. Well, let's ease into this slowly, I remarked. The concept doesn't bother me. Actually, I think it's good. However, this is still a bit abrupt. 
Are you certain you want this? She gave me a glance and stated, I know what I want, with a voice full of confidence. I've never felt more confident that she had finally realized what she wanted after six years of marriage. Well, that pleased me. My comment, and that's why men say they don't understand women. But in reality nobody understands another human being. Because they see through their perspective not through others. And that is the problem. But I don't think anybody would get that because you're again looking through your own perceived ways.